Legal, legal. Um, okay, so pretty much, I can boil this whole chapter down into five bullets. Ta-da! Oops. Okay, great, fine, okay. Um, we're gonna talk quickly about, or less quickly about trademark law, and then quickly about trade dress, copyright, trade secrets, and false and deceptive advertising, okay? The last five things I'm gonna teach you in this course. Excited, right? Okay, so let's start with um, trademark law. I just wanna ask you guys, when you see, take out a product. Do you all have a product? Take out a product. Do you got a product? Um, look at the logo, look at the brand name, and see if you can find TM, R circle, or C circle. And in rare events, you might see SM. I'll explain SM in a second. But look at your products. I have an R circle on my Essential Water. What do you have on, on uh, Ozarka? R circle? Yeah. What do you guys have? I have a TM. TM? Who, what brand is that? It's not mine. It was here. No worries. Yeah. Equate. Yeah. Equate. It's TM. from Walmart. Uh, <laughs> talking about Walmart. My second and final visit to Walmart. Uh, okay, cool. Anybody else have a TM or an S, or R circle or C circle? What do you have? R circle. R circle? R circle. R circle. C circle. C circle. Where's that? What is it? Okay. For words, right? Okay, cool. So, do you all know what the difference is between the R circle, the C circle, the TM, the SM? Trademark, the TM. So they're all trademarks. Uh, uh, they're, they're all under trademark law. You're right, TM is a trademark. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between TM and R circle? Um, one is registered. Yep, and the other? Trademark. Correct. Okay, so in terms of trademark law, first of all, a trademark, whether I'm talking T, M, R circle, C circle, I don't care what we're talking about right now, all of them protect product names, titles, taglines, slogans, logos, other designs, product shapes, sounds, smells. You can trademark a smell, color, or any other feature that distinguishes a product from another product, okay? Now we're gonna talk about the main difference between TM and R circle in one second. But before we go there, I wanna make sure that you do not confuse anything we're talking about tonight with patent. What is a patent? And then later we'll talk about trade secrets, which is kind of the opposite of a patent. What is a patent? Is it like protection over like a creation of a product or how it's created. Good. So someone can't. The create. formula? Yeah. Yes. A, exactly. A patent is legal protection over either blueprints, how something is made, formulated, built. Okay. You ever have you know somebody who's like, I have an idea, I'm going to patent it. You cannot patent ideas. I have lots of ideas, you guys. You know, I, I want to be able to fly from my house to here in like a you know, uh, uh, an airplane that I can fold up into a suitcase like the jet, uh, Jetsons, yeah? But I don't know how to build that, so I can't patent it, okay? A patent is the legal protection of a formula or a blueprint or how something is made. Is everybody clear about that? Okay, but a trademark protects all of this stuff. Now let's talk about the different types of trademarks. TM, R circle, C circle, okay? The main difference between a TM and an R circle is that a TM is an unregistered trademark. R circle is a registered trademark. What does that mean? What does it mean? So McDonald's uses, and actually the last one I just showed you, here's R circle and here is TM. So the, the golden arches are, are TM, <laughs> but here the entire design is an R circle. Go figure. What's the difference? What does registered versus unregistered mean? Like a TM has a things that aren't public, like a secret formula or something. Uh, not necessarily, no. So for again, a formula, not trademark, not copyright, a formula would be patenting, okay? And we're gonna talk about patents in a minute. We'll talk about when patents expire. The main problem with patents is that they have an expiration date, okay? 
which means that then that knowledge becomes public. But not what we're talking about. Right now, I'm just talking about names, slogans, taglines, logos, artwork. What's the difference between the R circle and the TM? What is the difference between registered and unregistered, or registered and not registered? Ideas? Okay. So registered means that the company has literally registered whatever we're talking about, a name, a term, a, a title, a slogan, a logo, with the USPTO, United States Patent and Trademark Office, okay? So this company has literally filed this artwork or name or logo or color, whatever it is that is a registered trademark, it is on file with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This logo is not. So you might sit there and say, well, how the heck could Starbucks not have registered their logo with the United States Patent and Trademark Office? Because it is so undeniably recognizable that it is Starbucks that it simply is telling the world, this is our unregistered trademark and we are the first company to use it. Okay? So our circle registered with the USPTO, TM not registered with the USPTO. Now, what happens in terms of bearing the legal burden to prove that you are the first to use your logo. And by the way, the other two I wanna talk about is SM. So TM is trademark for products, SM is trademark for services. SM stands for service mark. It's the same damn thing as trademark, identical, okay? And it's very rarely used. Most companies will just use TM. But who bears the burden of proof when it comes to a lawsuit? Not always, okay? And it, by the, the answer is it depends on whether you're registered or, un or unregistered. When you are a registered trademark, the United States Patent and Trademark Office has said, you are the first one to use this logo, it's yours. Who bears the burden of proof? The second comer. Do you follow? The company that is not registered. They bear the burden of proof. With an unregistered trademark, you bear the burden of proof to prove that you were the first to use it. How do you do that? If you haven't registered a trademark, how do you prove that you were the first to use this design or name or color or slogan or logo? How do you prove it? Look at two lawyers. Uh, but how do they prove it? It's really what I'm asking. How do you prove that? Sales. Who um, sells anything? Files. Maybe. Maybe. That's what I did. If you can prove it. Yeah. What else? Like, I guess, like a business license, or like when you first get started, when you have to go through all of those, like business licenses? Yeah, but nowhere in that business license process have you registered your logo. Can you or can you prove that the logo was in use? What else you got? Um, the people that uh, almost had the name, when you take something, the notary, you get it notarized? You could, absolutely. You could okay. get something notarized with a date, okay. sure. Um, you fashion designers, don't you know the old, like, mail a concept to yourself so you have a postmarked um, sealed envelope, <laughs> right? That's like an old school version of it. Okay. Um, here's the other one. Publish it. Oh, yes? Yeah. Starbucks can prove back to the 19, I don't know, 70s, whenever Starbucks was started, that it had ads, that it had published use of the, the, the Starbucks logo in whatever, a local publication or something, local newspaper, rad. That is how you can prove that the use of the logo goes back to a certain date, okay? But you can see why people go through the trouble of registering a trademark, agree? Because then all of a sudden the burden of proof is on the second part. Okay, good. There's another one. Um, when somebody does a logo, yes, there is a historical way of how they achieve that logo. So then, if they ever goes to court, they the the judge can say, well, how did you come up with this logo? Like to the other people. Yeah, hard to prove though, because the other party could have a story about you know how they design the logo. Really, it comes down to can you prove in publishing that you were the first to use logo in a time and date stamped something, publication, advertising, something like that. Okay, now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about copyright in one second, but as a general rule of thumb, what does copyright protect? If trademark protects names and logos and colors and taglines, what does a copyright protect? Intellectual property. Um, th this is intellectual property too. 
What kind of intellectual property? A logo is intellectual property. It's not physical, it's intellectual. What kind of intellectual property does a copyright C circle protect? Written. Written. Now that's a little confusing because the word McDonald's is written, but that would be our circle. That's a registered trademark. When you say written, what do you mean? Well, like for um, interior design, like if we, any of our sketches, we copyright it. Okay. So no one can reproduce So before we go there, you're right. Any type of architectural drafting is yeah. C-circle C copyright. Mm -hmm. In general, bodies of words. Give me examples of bodies of words. Music. Music. A song. Sorry. What did you got? Yeah, I'm loving anybody else. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Still. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. A little body of words. Okay. That's good. Okay. Little body still trademark, registered okay. trademark. Um, song lyrics, oh, okay. scripts, an entire book. You write an entire manuscript or book or movie script. That's copyright. Bodies of words. Okay. And then, by the way, yes, architect architectural renderings are often are also copyrighted. Okay. okay. So, in terms of trademarks, here's your first quizzy question. The true test for trademark infringement is confusing similarity, and I want to talk to you about that. Um, not to be confused with substantial similarity, okay? And I'll explain to you what that means later. Confusing similarity. The key word here is if. If the average consumer believes that both products have come from the same source, there's infringement, okay? I want to tell you a story that doesn't really help me explain this. It actually is, it blows my mind. So here are two companies, Polo Ralph Lauren and the U.S. Polo Association. You all know this other brand? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. okay. So Polo Ralph Lauren took the U.S. Polo Association to court a lot of years ago, sued them for um, confusing similarity, okay? And so this, this um, court hearing went on and the judge ruled against Polo Ralph Lauren. The judge decided that there was enough of a differentiation that the, that the average consumer would understand that these are two completely separate companies and that the products that are being marketed are different products from different companies. Now, can I just ask you a quick question? Be honest. Did you know that these are two different companies? Did everybody know that? I thought it was like After a while. I thought it was like an Appreciate that. Like, that is, like the Michael, Michael Ford. Yeah, yeah, Michael Ford. Was fake. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, do you honestly think that the average consumer is smart enough, intelligent no. enough to know no. that those are two different companies? Look at, first of all, look at the logo itself. It's almost, it's a very, very, very similar silhouette. Look at the placement of the logo in the font. Mm -hmm. Two lines of copy, you know, in very similar color palette. I mean, I, do we think the average American is smart enough to know? Probably not. Okay, but again, this is a bad example because in this case, the court, the, the judge ruled that there wasn't enough confusing similarity that the customer should be able to discern that these are two different companies marketing two different products. Okay, that's confusing similarity in my book. Okay, now, in terms of trademark rules, first of all, the author talks a lot about why it's so desirable to have a coined brand name. Remind me again what a coined brand name is? Not made made up. Up. Right, can't look it up in the Webster's Dictionary, it's not an English word, it's made up, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's really easy to trademark or register trademark a coined brand name, you can own it, right? What you cannot own are generic American words, English words. Do you get that? Um, there's a reason why companies like Whiteout, I think I showed you Whiteout already, yes? Um, a lot of you never even realized that Whiteout is intentionally misspelled. Why? Because all of a sudden the misspelling makes it coined. And so the Whiteout company, whoever it's owned by, can literally register, can trademark that word. Rollerblade, another, here's an old school one. Um, the fact that they just merged the two together makes it a non-English word, we can trademark that. We can't trademark stuff like shredded wheat or super glue because they're generic English words. Cannot own them. Understood? Mm -hmm. The apple, we talked about that a bunch this term. Apple does not own the word apple. They can't. It's a generic English word. They own the logo, it's a registered trademark, but the word apple they don't own. Clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's okay. Now, um, how do we prove infringement? 
evidence of consumer confusion. Did confuse, not can confuse. The burden of proof in a lawsuit is that the company or the, the company suing has to prove that consumers were duped, not can be duped, were duped. Do you get that? Okay. For example, okay. here, Polo had to prove that customers truly believe that US Polo Association was the same company and made purchases under that false guise. And I, I guess, I don't know enough about the lawsuit, but I guess they were unable to prove that. So the evidence of consumer confusion is that consumers actually were duped, okay? That's what a company has to prove if it's gonna sue for infringement, trademark or copyright infringement. But not copyright, just trademark. I'm talking just about trademark right now. Okay? They also have to prove intent of the organization in using the mark and relatedness. So look, if US Polo Association was some completely different product category, some totally different uh, type of product, there would be no even possibility of trademark infringement because it's operating in some other category. You get it? But because the two companies are selling identical, literally identical products, right? Literally, different quality, agree. But literally identical products otherwise, um, that to me is grounds for trademark infringement, even though we lost, okay? So the evidence has to be that the, that the infringement actually did confuse, did dupe consumers, that there was intent on the organization to fool consumers, and that the two companies are related in a related industry or selling related products. Understood? Okay, this is gonna be different, you'll see in a second from copyright where it ha there has to be substantial similarity, okay? We'll talk about copyright in one second. Okay, good? All right. Um, okay, we've kind of talked about this already, but by using the mark in association with your products over time, you gain trademark protection. Register the trademark at the state and federal levels um, to avoid having to deal with common law, okay? TM is common law. You're basically telling the world, hey, this is my intellectual property, do not use it, right? That's common law. When you register, you're registering and then the, the burden of proof is on the second comer, okay? Um, trademark infringement, after five years of registration, a mark becomes incontestable. So the first five years that you've registered your trademark, somebody out of the woodwork can come and say, no, this is my trademark. But then it's on the USPTO to do the research. Okay, when you register a trademark in the USPTO, they do research to make sure that nobody else in the marketplace is using your said logo, brand, name, slogan, whatever the case is. But there's a five year period where the registration is contestable. After five years, it becomes incontestable and it lasts for 10 years. You renew every 10 years. Okay, does anybody in here have a registered trademark? Logo. I do, but it's in Mexico and it's my, my, my thing. Okay, so in Mexico, laws are completely different. What the courts require mm -hmm. may be different, et cetera. Who else, anybody have a register? You have a register uh, brand name, logo? Yes, brand name. Okay, all right, questions here. <clears throat> Does everybody understand the five year contestable period and then the registered trademark gets renewed every 10 years? After the fifth year, the first fifth year, it becomes incontest incontestable. You own that artwork name, logo, whatever it is we're talking about, color, scent, whatever it is. Good? Okay, so, talked about this already. Um, to acquire trademark based on actually using the brand in commerce. So if you're already in business, you're already marketing your products, your products are out there, you simply need to attach the letters TM every time you use your logo. In your advertising, on your products, on your website, whatever the case is. It's simply telling the world, we own this design, okay? If you're not in business yet, our circle is the way to go. The only way to own a logo, a, a name, a trademark, when you're not in business yet is to register it. Because there would be no other way to prove that you are the first comer of that design, name, slogan, logo. Does everybody understand that? How do you do that? Register through the USPTO. 
Last time I checked, the rough costs were about $425 to file uh, a, 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 to file for a registered trademark. About $425 last time I checked. Okay? Questions? Good. All right. Topic number one done, the rest are quick, I promise. Number two, trade dress. Trade dress is um, the distinctive but aesthetic only components of a product. So these are things that are aesthetic elements of a product, but they don't work, they're not functional. So one example would be like the Coca-Cola bottle. I always use that example. Yeah, it doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't, it has no function, but it is, is a distinctive aesthetic, okay? Um, the story that I love to tell, this is the Apple iPhone 3. Does everybody remember this story? Yeah? So Apple iPhone 3 came out, Galaxy S came out, and what did they both have? Round edges. Yeah, round edges. And Apple sued Galaxy and won. The court determined that uh, the round edges were a distinctive aesthetic trade dress of Apple and that they were, in, they were infringing on the design, okay? I'm gonna give you another example. Um, this is one from the textbook. You know, our author uh, is from Hallmark, right? He was the director of marketing at Hallmark. So he says that like, if you're gonna just come up with like a birthday card design with a, some kind of floral aesthetic that simply says happy birthday, you cannot call that trade dress. It's not distinctive enough. It has to be something that's so distinctive that only your brand is known for it. Now, I go back. Rounded edges? Really? What's that? No. Really? Like, no, like, no, like yeah. doesn't, don't so many brands do rounded edges on things? I mean, that has a rounded edge. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right? But somehow Apple really owns the whole, like, the, the, the distinct, distinctive nature of the rounded edge of, um, and if you look, I'm just looking at your Apple iPad. Uh, your, your MacBook, and what is that? Oh, what, what do you have? Uh, Surface Pro. Surface, okay, cool. But I mean, the Surface Pro, it honestly doesn't have rounded edges. Yeah. It has much more like spiky corner edges, yeah. right? Yeah. Like Which is, it's, it's cool and it's distinctive. Mac, right? It's a Mac and it's got those like really fine rounded edges, right? So they call that trade dress, and you know, who am I to say a judge ruled in their favor, but like a generic birthday card that opens the way all the <laughs> Not trade dress, okay? But here's an example. Um, a line of greeting cards in unusual sizes that open from the top with rounded edges printed in green tinted recycled paper, all for 99 cents, addressing the same theme. That might be considered by a court to be trade dress that a company could <coughs> copyright, protect, trademark, okay? So everyone understand what trade dress is? It is the aesthetic visual but non-functioning components of a product, okay? I don't want to use the word packaging, but it's almost packaging. Okay, now, next quiz question tonight, all right? Let's talk about the differences between knockoffs and counterfeits, because Americans use these two words really similarly, and man, they mean totally different things. What is the difference between a knockoff and a counterfeit? Like, is this a knockoff? Or a counterfeit? Uh, no, um, counterfeit. Counterfeit? Raise your hand if you say counterfeit. Raise your hand if you say it's a knockoff. Okay, so what makes a knockoff a knockoff and a counterfeit a counterfeit? Any ideas? Um, a one, the, the one that is pretending to be the brand versus the one that just looks says that it, if it's similar. Like the one that like wants to, you know, have the customer think that it's the actual brand. So let me ask you this question, and then I'll let you guys weigh in. If you walk into a Banana Republic and you see lots of garments in Banana Republic that look like Prada, that look like Gucci, that look like um, Tom Brown, you menswear people, is that a knockoff or a counterfeit? Knockoff. Knockoff. Okay, that's similar. They're changing. It's like Louis Vuitton, fake Louis Vuitton bags that have the Louis Vuitton logo on versus the ones that like have some weird ass semblance. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. A counterfeit is any illegal use of a brand name, period. I don't care what the product looks like, whether it looks like it or not. 
I could put, I could slap Louis Vuitton on a plastic garbage bag, and that is counterfeit. Are you clear? Counterfeit. It is an illegal use of a brand name. It is an unauthorized use of a brand name. It doesn't matter what the product looks like. That's illegal. Counterfeits are illegal. A knockoff is simply imitating the aesthetic of a product to the extent the law allows. And by the way, in the United States, we have very flimsy, flexible laws about how much copying can exist. You all know that, yes? You fashion designers should especially know that. In France, man, the laws are so strict. Design in France is intellectual property. You as a designer, you design something, you own that. People can't copy it. Many, many, many famous French lawsuits. Ralph was sued in France and lost. Um, copying, I think Yves Saint Laurent or something. Um, here in America, man, you walk into a, a Banana Republic is a great example. You walk into a Banana Republic, 90% of the merchandise you're seeing is knocked off of higher end designers. 90%, okay? Everybody understand the difference between a knockoff, which is an, a, a legal, legal copy, and a counterfeit, which is an illegal use of a brand name, don't care what the product looks like. Yes? Yeah. Okay, beautiful, very good. Copyright, okay. So you already told me copyright is the protection of what? What do we say? Content. Yeah. Money worth. Content, content is a tough one because a logo is technically content, <clears throat> but bodies of words, bodies of words, okay? So it could be anything from uh, a movie script, novels, a song. Um, it could be other stuff like computer software, architecture. Laura mentioned, uh, you know, interior designers and architects, copyright plans, floor, floor plans, okay? But generally it's bodies of words, okay? We copyright bodies of words. Now let me explain to you the difference between trademark and copyright. What did we say trademark has to prove in a court of law? Identity. What kind of identity? Publication. Yeah. Your but Features. in order to prove infringement, to win a lawsuit, what do you have to prove if you're trying to sue a company for trademark infringement? Yeah, you in the lesson. Lesson. Yes, I'm going to go like this. Confusing similarity. Oh, confusing. Look at my hand. Yeah. Confusing similarity. Mm -hmm. Here, we have to prove substantial similarity. Okay, so let's talk about plagiarism. If you go onto a website and you grab a body of words and you massage them a little bit and you change a couple, you all know what I'm talking about, you change a couple words around, yeah? You probably could pass it off as your own writing, yes? You make it just different enough and you're cool, okay? With copyright, you have to prove substantial similarity. Do you understand what that means? Yeah. A majority of the body of words has to be identical. If you want, if one artist is going to sue another artist for, uh, for copyright infringement of a song, the words have got to be pretty damn similar. You with me? Yeah. So just uh, going back one more time to the polo. These are not that similar according to the judge, right? But confusing similarity, they don't need to be that similar. In terms of copyright, they need, the, the, the bodies need to be almost identical. Clear about that? Understand the difference between confusing similarity and substantial similarity. Confusing similarity, they need to be close enough. Substantial similarity, they need to be like 98% the same. the same in order to prove uh, infringement. Got it? Okie dokie. In addition to copyright infringement, I want to talk just about one other thing, cyber squatting. Do you all know what cyber squatting is? Yes? So there are these nasty organizations out there that go and buy up a whole bunch of domain names, URLs, yeah? yeah. They own all the, they buy them up for cheap, right? And then business comes along and they want to own a URL for their new business. Yeah, and uh-oh, a cyber squatter owns it already and what do they do? Extort, okay? That's another issue with like some copy, you know, copyright infringement, right? Companies that are buying up all these domain names and extorting companies. You all remember the Google? Oh yeah. Google, I think I told you guys. 
um, somebody owned some format of Google.com, I forget what the variance was, and he wound up pretty much extorting Google and he sold it to Google for like, not a whole lot of money, like $6,000, I think, which is really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like you moron, right? <laughs> you could have had enough money for like future generations. Um, and he wound up selling the domain name back to back to Google. Cyber Squad. Everybody understand? Yeah. Okay. Good. What are we up to? Number four out of five. Yeah. Okay. Trade secrets. Before I explain trade secrets, remind me again what a patent is. If you have a patent, what have you filed for? Protection of procedures. Good procedures formulas, how something is made, done, all right? So Coca-Cola, the most famous freaking formula ever, yeah, has never filed a patent for its formula. Why not? Because can't people like, if you put it as a patent, patent it's public like information. Do that still, right? Okay, a patent is not public information, it's, it's, it's private, but a patent expires. And then what happens when a patent expires? What okay. happens when a pharmaceutical company, a drug company, Generic. gets a patent, the patent expires, and then what can other companies do? Make the same thing. Correct, exactly. They can create generic versions of that formula, all right? Mm -hmm. So Coca-Cola has never, ever in 200 years patented its formula. Why? Because it wants it to be secret forever. And mm -hmm. also, if you go to the court with Coca-Cola, you gotta lose it, right? Probably, I mean, <laughs> but think about it, if Coca-Cola patented its formula, the patent expired, and it probably would have expired right by now, it would have become public knowledge. And then other companies could very easily make it, make it up, okay? So, what I'm talking about is the opposite of patent, and it is trade secret. Sometimes it is better to keep something a trade secret than to patent it, okay? And I also wanna tell you guys, um, design patents last for 14 years, Okay, so the design of a model, of buildings, they last for 14 years. Formula patents last for 20, okay? So a new pharmaceutical drug that comes onto the market, that brand name can own it for 20 years. And they usually own the science and the research behind it, 20 years, and then it becomes public. One last thing I wanna tell you about this, the Economic Espionage Act of 1996 protects against trade secret theft. Have I ever told you the famous Coca-Cola trade secret theft story? No? Give me the 30 second version of it. One day, the phone rings at Coca-Cola corporate headquarters in Atlanta, and who picks up the phone? The administrative assistant to like the chief, whoever. One of the few people in the entire corporation that had access to the formula. And on the other line, it was supposedly PepsiCo, and they were offering this individual like tens of thousands of dollars, but it probably wasn't enough money, to divulge the trade secret of you give me the formula. And this woman said, okay, I'll meet you in a dark alley on a corner or whatever. Now, meanwhile, the person on the other line was not PepsiCo, it was the FBI, it was a sting operation. And she got caught basically trying to fork over Coca-Cola's trade secret. And uh, it's a famous marketing story. And you know, things didn't go so well for her. Let's just put it that way, all right? That is Economic Espionage Act of 1996. It is illegal for you inside a company to steal um, that company's intellectual property, okay? And this is why in Ralph Lauren, whenever you got fired, the Grim Reaper would come and take you away from your desk and you could never go back to get the picture of your family. They'd ship it to you in a box, right? So that you couldn't still take trade secrets with you. What trade secrets we had, I have no idea. All right. No idea. Um, when you go work for Oprah, what trade secrets she has, I have no idea. But I don't know if you guys know, you sign a lengthy confidentiality contract with the Harpo Corporation. Do you know that? Yeah? Ironclad legal document that you sign. I don't know what trade secrets Oprah has, but none of us ever will either, okay? Um, confidentiality agreements, okay? Some companies will also prohibit moonlighting. What is moonlighting? I encourage my employees here at Wade College to do lots of moonlighting. Moonlighting is good. But lots of companies frown on them. What is moonlighting? Is it like Insisting talking about? Work at night. 
Perfectly another job. Yeah, and it, um, it used to be me at night, but now it means anytime, right? Yeah. Basically, it means working this, another job. Why do you think companies don't want employees working another job? You don't want to do it. You don't want to like jeopardize the kind of procedures that they do. Right. Like if you work for Coca Cola, you probably shouldn't be working for a competitor too, yeah. right? Um, because who knows why? Okay. So, and then <laughs> here's my Ralph Lauren example: carefully orchestrated termination, so employees cannot take proprietary info with them. Right? That's theft of trade secrets. Okay, last of the five topics. False and deceptive advertising. I wanna talk about both of these. Have you guys seen this company, Dermatage? This is an actual ad. I am not playing around. <laughs> what do you think of this ad? It's fake. Oh do you no, think no. this product could possibly no, result no, not in, this. in these? Never. In this never, result? Never. Never doing it. Not possible. Ever. And obviously, this company got sued and lost, okay? This is deceptive advertising. Does everybody agree? Yes. Deceptive? Yeah. Yes? So, deceptive is not that it did mislead, um, it could mislead. Does everybody agree? This could mislead. Yes? It is not necessary to prove actual deception. The FCC, Federal Communications Commission, does not allow any type of communication that could mislead. Okay, so there's one example. Here's another one. You guys familiar with this palm? I may have mentioned them once before to you. Palm, yes or no? Yeah. It's a pomegranate juice brand, all right? They had a series of ads all about how this product literally is like a superfood and it will help you cheat death. And another another series was about how it's so heart healthy that you will avoid heart attacks. But well, I got news for you. They did absolutely no scientific research and could not back any of these claims up. And they got sued directly by the FCC and lost. You cannot make these types of claims if you don't have scientific research to back it up. That could mislead a consumer. That's false and deceptive advertising. The news around that is like so, no. You don't see the news around that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's like. No. Cheat death. No. They couldn't substantiate it, right? Yeah. Did not, there was no scientific evidence to say that this was the next power multivitamin. Yeah. They lost. Mm -hmm. Cannot make claims about health, death, if you have not. Use your scientific study. Yeah. Okay. Not to be confused with the one last thing I want to teach you tonight, puffery. What's FCC, Federal Communications Commission? But hold on, puffery. What is the difference between making a false claim and puffery? So false claim, what, what does it do? What could it do? Mislead. mislead. Could mislead. Okay. Puffery is an acceptable exaggeration. That's all you got to know acceptable exaggeration. When we say the world's best coffee, the best a man can get, the world's most liked vodka, the best coffee for the best you, do I need to have a scientific study done to prove these statements? Why not? Why are these different from this product will save your heart and this product will take 50 years off your life? What's the difference? It's too generic. Confidence, the brand is like sounding confident. Like well, like one is an opinion and one is trying to stay the fact. Good. Okay, fine. I like that. Opinion based. Mm -hmm. The law um, sees these as the consumer having to have a level of skepticism. If I tell you this is the world's best coffee, are you taking that literally? No. You're taking it as an acceptable exaggeration. These are things that companies can say and they can say it loosely. Okay? Puffery is not illegal because the consumer is expected to have some level of skepticism. Okay? Got it? Skepticism. Okay, let's review and I'll let you take the quiz. Trademark law. What's the difference between TM and R? Unregistered and registered. Good. TM is unregistered, R is registered, right? Um, trade dress. What does it protect? Aesthetic and aesthetic. Beautiful. Aesthetic elements of a product that don't have a use, right? Mm -hmm. Copyright law, what does it protect? 
Body of words. What does trademark law protect? All of this is intellectual property. Trademark is about the brand identity, logos, names, slogans, taglines, right? Colors, smell. Copyright is bodies of words. Clear about that? Yes. Here's the list: product names, titles, like, right? Most things that we we identify with the with the logo. By the way, every year, Starbucks sues and closes. Companies all around the world. Take a look at these. Isn't this amazing? Yeah. Japanese company, company in Tehran, Rome, Korea, China. I mean, every year. Every year. Wow. They find a lot of these are just small local coffee shops. They think they're going under the radar. You can't do this. Yes? This is confusing similarity. USA Bucks Bar? I mean, with the star? Come on. Right? And with the silhouette of, of a girl. I mean, this one is pretty damn close. Yeah. Right? You can't do this kind of stuff. Okay? It is, it, it will dupe the consumer. No doubt about it. Okay? It'll dupe the consumer. Maybe not that one, but the rest. Okay. Um, trade secret? What is it? The opposite of a patent. Yeah. And the number of stripes. Right. It's simply a, the, the company choosing not to patent um, a whatever formula or trade secret could be anything. Well, what would happen if somebody actually does like steal your secret, like you're screwed? Uh, you are, but there's a massive lawsuit that's going to happen and you're going to win. Yes. But Jess, you're right, you're screwed. Especially if it becomes public knowledge, you're right. False or deceptive advertising. So what can't you do? Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't just present the facts. But what do you call it when you just make an acceptable exaggeration? All right. You guys take your quiz. It's on already. And I will set up Jeopardy. Did everybody get three sheets? I did not get any. Oh, okay, so one, two, three, and the front.